If you do like these tank chats, do please subscribe to the Tank Museum's YouTube channel. This tank chat's going to be about the SDKFZ 121. To most of us, the Panzer II, that's how we know it. Now, I've already done a tank chat on the Panzer I, and in that, I've given a lot more background to that period after the First World War, the 1920s and early 1930s, where the, the German military and von Siecht, how he looks at the German commander-in-chief rebuilding the German military, what are they going to do, how are they going to experiment, and his interest in manoeuvre warfare. So I'd strongly suggest, have a look at that one if you haven't already, um, because the Panzer II fits into that bigger picture. Uh, the Germans at the beginning of the 1930s, they're looking at building a Panzer I, that is going to be a fighting tank, but really behind it as well, it's a tank that's being designed and built to give the German military experience in the use of armoured vehicles. They want to build two other vehicles that ultimately become, and we know as, as the Panzer III and Panzer IV, those are the vehicles they're really going to be thinking of as their main fighting tanks for the future. Um, and I'm going to touch on a tank that is, comes into service or is put together as what might be called an interim model. Because what happens at the beginning of the 1930s, the German military look at the idea of the tank for three main purposes. They're going to see it as an infantry support weapon and in that sense, think back World War I, think of a vehicle that can cross a battlefield that might have barbed wire, it needs to crush that barbed wire, and it is proof against machine gun fire because it was a machine gun in World War I that cut mobility on the battlefield. So that first role is to advance, be able to take machine gun fire and probably be armed with a machine gun so it can put down suppressing fire on the enemy. And the idea there is that that will be a, an infantry support vehicle. The second type of tank they're looking at will be, or the role they can see with a tank, is for anti-tank warfare. In other words, if a tank's coming your way, you put a powerful enough gun on a mobile platform that we can then meet enemy tanks and help defend and sometimes attack enemy tanks as well. And the third type, um, or the third use of the tank that the German military see, is for what they're looking at as independent operations, perhaps with other mobile or automotive vehicles. So in other words, and we can see that developing into the ideas of uh, what we know of now as Blitzbrade, but mobile warfare independently. So let those tanks go and do their business, perhaps with some other types of support vehicles with them uh, in a much more uh, maneuverist way. And the Germans, of course, really like that idea and want to experiment with it in the 1930s. So three different ranges. Now, the Panzer I in many ways will meet that first criteria, but it didn't necessarily, it wasn't going to perhaps be able to take on enemy tanks. They, they think about putting a two centimetre gun on it, but that's dropped. And that's where Panzer II comes along. Panzer II, at the time, they come up with a production or a, a hide, a code word as it were, it's going to be LAS 100, agricultural tractor with a 100 horsepower engine. And they're looking at that one, not just because actually we're having real trouble in the background. The Germans know that their ultimate Panzer 3s and Panzer 4s are going to be a fair old way off coming down the line. So we're going to need something a little bit beefier than the Panzer 1 that is already starting to go through its development and then production phase. So that's why they come up with the idea of the Panzer II. They look at the Panzer I, they in many ways a Panzer II is a slightly enlarged version. They set out a specification for the Panzer II that's going to be, it's about six tonnes, they want about 10 millimetres, maybe a bit more of, of armour plate on it. But the key thing is they want the two centimetre KWK L55 gun put on it. Um, it's called the L30 gun, it's basically the Flak 30 that um, has been converted for use in a tank. And they see that in the early 1930s as being a good enough weapon to go through back then most of the known light tanks that are out there. They also know, they're not naive, they know later on that it is not going to be an effective weapon against heavily armoured tanks. So it's, it's not thought of in that way. So 
the Waffenamt, the German military authorities, issue out this specification. Krupp and Daimler uh, get in there very early, um, but then they open it out to further competition and uh, along comes Mann and also Henschel, they're involved. They all go away, they come back within a year with some prototype vehicles that are then tested. And in the end, the model that is taken forward, um, the two companies that are in essence chosen, they look at Mann for the chassis below, um, the track system, etc. And then they look at Daimler-Benz for doing the superstructure and the turret on the top and they in essence become what we nowadays we might call the the parent body for the manufacturer when it comes to the manufacturer many other companies are involved um, and a, a large number of those early mentioned manufacturers they're actually involved in the process as well um, but there's almost like a design authority is kept with Daimler-Benz um, and MAN now they start this process this is 1934 when they've been um, putting out the orders for doing this um, what's an interesting one is that the Germans at the time realised, because of the problems they've already got, they are new to this tank building business in quantity. So, uh, as we've mentioned on some of the other tank chats, they've got major issues in the 30s about uh, actually getting effective systems and subsystems to work, um, getting the manufacturing capacity built up, and delays that always come in this. And I just want to read you uh, a small document that actually cites, and it's a contemporary document, that cites how the Germans, it's really interesting to see how they look at the problem they're going to face. It is necessary to test all of these experimental models over long distance. In addition, it is absolutely necessary to detect and correct any weaknesses in the design by subjecting a model to test firing and explosions. The time needed for these tests is lengthy. Failures occur, parts disassemble, um, and this requires a long time. Design modifications are initiated, followed by reassembly and further testing. Tests of the replaced part must start again at zero mileage. Based on experience, conversion to series production is certain to bring considerable difficulties that must be overcome on a case-by-case -case basis. Similar problems have been experienced throughout the entire weapons field. When industry can deliver, deliver heavy Panzerkampfwagen types is not the only concern. The first prerequisite must be that a mature design has been created. If the schedule for series production is rushed, backfit modifications are unpreventable and expensive as far as they are even possible. The combat value of the Panzer may be reduced to scrap value. This would also result in delaying systematic development of the equipment that is technically superior to foreign equipment. So they are really clear, the German military are really clear that that testing regime is essential if they're going to get a worthwhile product. So you'll see, and it becomes rather confusing, that once they've picked that first design, they then start making Ausrungs, but with a small letter, in as opposed to the big letter, the small letter are these pre-production series that they're doing in batches of 25, A1, A slash one, A slash two, etc. and they're going to B and C. And all of these early ones, uh, again, you can follow, if you're very clever about the imagery, you can look at all the pictures and work out which one's which, as they are coming to ultimately a design that becomes capital letter A, the Ausrung A. In other words, the ones that are going to go into production. And they start that production in 1936. Um, and they even then, it's well over a year before those first Panzer II tanks actually reach the field army so that they can start actually really operating and trialing with them. So this again, it sounds like a long process. It's quite quick compared to modern tank design, but actually they are adamant that they are need to go through this various types of experimental process. So what have they got with that early series of, uh, of Panzer II's? Um, they end up with about uh, 10 millimeters of armor on the front. Um, the KWK gun that they're putting on it, um, this KWK 30, the two centimeter gun, it will go through at about 700 meters, 10 millimeters of armor. Um, and again, so from the, their point of view, they realise they want their tanks to have slightly more. So straight away, they're upping the armour as part of the specification and they think 15 millimetres is a minimum for production tanks when they actually go into service. 
Again, on those earlier modeler A slash one, A slash two, etc., you'll see a very different suspension. It's a suspension that is being copied from the Panzer I. A lot of the ideas and the fundamental shape um, for a now developing into a six-ton vehicle come from the Panzer I. But by the end of those test vehicles, they've got the familiar suspension that we're used to seeing now on most of the Panzer IIs, um, which is a, a kind of crank arm suspension, five rubber road wheels or rubber coated road wheels, um, uh, an arm with a springing system on the top. Um, so again, that goes into with the first Alpha A, capital letter Alpha A, that's what you'll see going into production. Relatively narrow tracks. Um, the turret system, again, that familiar faceted take turret system that you're looking on and they're looking at for those first production vehicles as well as a three-man crew. So inside there, you've got a driver in the front as you face a vehicle, he's on the right-hand side. Um, it, behind sits a radio operator. He's not actually in the front of the tank. He actually goes behind the driver. And then up in the turret, you've got the commander who operates that two centimeter gun. Um, he's got magazines of eight rounds um, that it's a semi-automatic weapon and about 180 rounds of uh, this two centimeter ammunition is carried actually inside the tank. Uh, for the production vehicles, uh, they end up going for the petrol engine, um, the Maybach HL uh, 62 TRM engine, that's the one that powers it around. It will give the early models of the vehicles about 25 miles an hour. Later on, they get up to about 35 miles an hour and a range of about 120 miles on the road. Um, so they've got there a tank which now again, and so often happens, people look back on, think it's rather small, a bit fairly weak. Actually, as a contemporary tank at the time, this fitted in with much that was going on around it. And again, in those early days, remembering that the German military are really looking at enemies, their, their biggest concern early on in the early 30s is still looking at Poland rather than France and the bigger tanks that the French then start coming out towards the end of the 30s. Now those production tanks that, that go out there, um, they are produced in Alstrom A, B and C, the first three main models. There's very different little differences. Now they've got done their experimentation between those first three production models Really, the difference there between A, B and C is because what happens is the German military are thinking what becomes the Panzer III and Panzer IV will be ready. Actually, they're not ready. So they say to the factories, right, here's another order. Keep making what we know as, as the Panzer II. And so they end up calling, for example, Alpha from C. It's pretty much the same as B and A before. It's just got slightly different visors on it. The real reason there's a new model it's because a new order has come to the factories. Now, by 1939, the Germans are very fully aware that actually on the battlefield, they've had experience in the Spanish Civil War, then they go into Poland, that the armor thickness on the Panzer II is not really up to the modern battlefield. So even though they've done that experimentation, that they've done all that, and they've mentioned in their document, they have to go back and retrofit extra armor on many of the vehicles um, and that retrofit so for example they put uh, 20 millimeter extra armor on curves around the front of the turret there they'll have extra armor bolted onto the front to thicken it up all of those come out in kits and they're issued to the uh, the field army um, by may of 1940 when the fighting starts and the invasion of france belgium and holland um, not all the tanks have been upgraded now, interesting, there's about 1,300 Panzer IIs um, are now in service with the German army. They hadn't really expected to build that many, but it was this idea of keeping the production line going. And that makes up for the invasion of France in May of 1940. So that means the Panzer II is about 36% of the 2,500 odd German and Czech tanks that are actually used in that invasion. So that's a really sizable proportion there. In fact, they're the most numerous German tank that's being used in the invasion. The irony, of course, is that actually the German panzer divisions that get so much attention in that campaign, there's only 16 tank and motorized or panzer and motorized divisions in the 150 plus divisions in the German military. 10 panzer divisions, six motorized, and that means that this rather small tank 
is actually a significant part of that victory in 1940, what Hitler calls the miracle with the breakthrough at Sedan, um, the advance through the Ardennes forest, and the speed that the Germans operate, which causes the, really for the French army and certainly the British as well, those problems. And again, so it's the speed of this tank um, and the way that it's being operated, not is relatively um, small uh, firepower, it's small armour protection levels, all of that, that's not what's doing the victory. What is doing the victory is how it's being used, the tactical use of this tank for a great strategic outcome. And what's really going on, and if you look at some of the German reports and the orders that are given beforehand, they are saying to the tank commanders, they know the armour protection on this is not very good, so they're saying to the commanders, race towards the enemy anti-tank guns, um, try to keep manoeuvre, and the French actually respond to this. They actually, some of the French reports are, their anti-tank guns, which are very powerful, very good, probably one of the best ones on the battlefield, actually they can't, they find the mobility of the tanks coming towards them, the problem about trying to knock them out. So that's where they find their problems there. Um, so the commanders are told to uh, use their mobility and their speed. And one of the great things about the Panzer divisions from the Germans point of view, is that that sense of they are using this battle like a sprint. The French military are looking like this as they're coming to it as if it's gonna be a long distance run. And everything that goes on is the German military are getting inside that decision-making process of the French army. So tanks like this, again, um, already by May of 1940, they're looking a little bit smaller than the other tanks that are there. The Germans are starting to get their Panzer III's and Panzer IVs into service, now in better numbers. Actually, very quickly, the Panzer II is being outclassed and is starting to get relegated to other roles. But that moment, this is one of those key vehicles that really, um, are the iconic moment of the German military in May of 1940, defeating that much bigger French, British, Belgium armies and those better tanks that were lined up against them. So that's its really great moment in history. Now with the Panzer II, they carry on the development. So we've had A, B and C models. Uh, D and E, they change the suspension to torsion bar. They don't make that many of them. Um, and what ends up happening is some of those ones they used in Poland, they're actually withdrawn. And most of those are then converted into flamethrower tanks. They in turn aren't that successful. So many of those then get, uh, go back to the factories. And as a lot of Panzer IIs are either rebuilt or the later models are being built, they're used for other roles rather than a turreted gun tank, as it were. So they start ending up being the chassis used for Vespers or self-propelled artillery. Um, some are used, their turrets are taken off and they're used as ammunition carriers. And some of these Panzer II turrets you'll see are then reused as defensive positions on things like the Atlantic Wall, static positions, so they're being reused. They stop actually making the Panzer II in January of 1944, although you'll still see them being used in various capacities. They're used, they're relegated to other roles, sometimes reconnaissance, sometimes internal security duties. Um, a lot of them are used for training. So their real moment comes early on in 1940, certainly in the invasion of Russia as well, but then you'll be seeing them used in those secondary roles rather than as a, a frontline battle tank all the time. This particular model that I'm standing next to is again, is a later model. Um, they start, they go for that D and E, they then go on with F and a number of other models where they actually go back to the original suspension system. They thicken the armor, they slightly change the shape of the front. Again, if you look, um, there's plenty of books out there where you can follow all the different modifications. Like so many German tanks, even within that model, um, there's a change goes on throughout. Uh, and again, on this one, even though this one was actually sent out, it's built in 1942, it's sent out to North Africa and it's captured in Tunisia, brought back um, for evaluation here as an F model. There's some little details that are always interesting to look at. One of the things they picked up on was um, the idea that you, if you haven't got the weapon to penetrate armour, you tend to aim for what you know are going to be vulnerable points. In other words, vision slits, um, the sighting systems, etc. So some of the early Panzer II had a little dummy cone on top of the turret. That was to look like that's where the sight was for the gun. In fact, the sights for the main weapons always been in the middle of the mantlet. 
and on this one what they did with the F model they've actually put on the other side from the driver another dummy vision port with the idea that people might shoot at that rather than the actual place where the real driver is looking out and uh, he's got his optics there as well looking through as well a periscopic system in there. So on the vehicle um, by this stage they've got up to about uh, 35 millimeters of armor protection on the front so it's much much thicker for the L model of the Panzer II, and we'll talk about that one probably as a separate tank chat, that's a Lux, which is a, a very different model. It's, it's really morphed into a completely different tank there. So um, really with this sort of model, the F, we're coming to the end. There's about 500 Fs are made. That's the end of the, the main production of the standard, as we call it, Panzer II tank. Um, so again, with this one, you can see there's a new cupola on the top. Um, for the commander, so he's got all round vision. Uh, different bins, again, as you look along the sides there, you can see that they add things. Um, the engine at the rear is traditional sort of transmission that you see in those earlier. Um, drivers in the front there that he can look around, and by this model, they've now brought the radio operators to sit next to the driver, so he's up the front. Early models have got a different shape, front chassis with a, a cutaway uh, on the front there. Um, so all in all, it does look a relatively small tank. It did have that enormous effect in 1940, which is its great place, as I mentioned, in history. And uh, at this particular model, even though we've actually, it was captured in North Africa, to tell the story as we do in the museum here, we've actually painted in that pre-war two-tone camouflage scheme. Um, so it sits in our 1940 section, although it's a bit of a cheat. This is actually a slightly later tank. Um, but a really important vehicle, and again, one that we hope you find interesting as well. If you like these films, please do subscribe to the Tank Museum's YouTube channel, and if you can, please do support us on Patreon.